Again, welcome and thanks so much for joining. As I mentioned a moment ago, um, all of our attendees are muted. So if you have questions or anything that you'd like to share with us, please use um, the online uh, chat box or the question and answer tool and we'll be sure to respond to that throughout the webinar. Um, <clears throat> I also want to mention that um, this webinar series has attracted over 330 individuals from 23 different countries. So we're truly honored and grateful to have um, each of you on uh, this webinar today. So thanks so much for joining us and we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so as we've mentioned in the, our previous webinars, um, this is only educational in nature. Um, we are not marketing or promoting probiotics, um, and they are not currently approved for the prevention of neck or other neonatal diseases. And for those of you who aren't quite uh, so familiar with the Next Society, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And we're dedicated to building a world without neck, and we are working to bring together diverse stakeholders so we can better drive patient-centered neck research. We want to improve care practices and just raise awareness about this devastating disease. Um, for those of you who haven't yet registered for the next symposium, I hope you'll consider joining us um, and registering on our event page. I did include the link to our event right page in the chat box, so you can check that out if you'd like. Um, but this will be the only internationally attended neck meeting in North America and just a really rare opportunity for us to bring multidisciplinary teams together um, that are working to build a world without neck. Um, and this conference is presented by the Next Society through a partnership with the section of pediatric surgery with generous support from the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute um, and the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. So we hope uh, to see many of you in just in a, less than a month in Ann Arbor. So hope you can join us. Um, I also want to mention that the world's leading neck charities have established May 17th as International Neck Awareness Day. Um, I shared another link in our chat box about nine things you need to know about neck, um, just an opportunity for us to raise awareness about this disease. Um, we've also on, uh, opened our online shop where you can purchase um, different neck merchandise and just, again, help us re raise awareness about this devastating disease. Uh, so if you're on social media especially, um, we'd really appreciate you sharing your photos, tagging us in your tweets, um, and using the hashtags prevent neck and this is neck. So um, we'd love for you to join us uh, between now and May 17th, uh, Teresa awareness about this disease. Um, let's do some quick introductions of our faculty. Um, so as many of you know, I'm Jennifer Camster. I'm the founder and director of the Next Society. I founded the organization about a year after my son died from complications uh, of neck just before his first birthday. And I'm so delighted to welcome Dr. Mark Underwood from UC Davis and Dr. Robbie Patel from Emory University. They both, yeah, hi. <laughs> they both serve on the Next Society Scientific Advisory Council and we're just so grateful to both of them. And then we're so excited to welcome our guest faculty speakers for today. Um, we have Adam Mason and Dr. Jay Kim. Adam Mason is an attorney who recently represented Yale New Haven Hospital in a lawsuit involving the use of probiotics with neonates. And Adam will also be joining us at the next symposium. Um, he's gonna be facilitating a session titled Probiotics and Neck, what we can learn from experience resulting in litigation. So you definitely don't wanna miss Adam's presentation at the next symposium. So please um, be sure, I hope you can join us in June. And then Dr. Kim is a neonatologist and gastroenterologist at UC San Diego. He's one of uh, the Next Society's founding scientific advisory council members and has truly been just fundamental to our organization's growth and success. So thank you, Jay, for being part of this work. Um, and Dr. Kim will, of course, also be presenting at the next symposium. So you certainly don't want to miss his presentation. So I hope you can join us. Um, here's a quick overview of the topics we're going to be covering today. Um, we do have a lot of information that we are going to be sharing with you, um, and so unfortunately we do expect this to run over um, 60 minutes by a bit. Um, if you need to leave uh, before we conclude this webinar, um, please know that we will be posting the recording on the Next Society's website, and we'll email that link out, so um, no worries if you can't stay past um, the hour. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Kim, who will get us started with a presentation on are we moving too fast on probiotics, um, efficacy, safety, and other considerations. So thank you all so much. And I'm going to stop sharing and send it over to Jay. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Jen. I'm going to take the next 10 minutes or so to give you a perspective of, uh, of some concerns in the field as we're fastly moving. Uh, in the area of, of use of probiotics in the preterm arena. These are my disclosures. And 
I want to start by going a little bit into the past to get a sense of what we've been uh, what we've been doing with a couple areas, and it, there may be lessons learned from uh, these two examples. One is the use of corticosteroids postnatally, so after birth, where we were using uh, at the very beginning very high dose uh, steroids for the treatment of BPD or chronic lung disease. And this gave us immediate satisfaction to be able to ameliorate um, the, the inflammation in the short term. But we realized uh, only after a full adoption that this was potentially detrimental to neurodevelopment. And we went through a period of moratorium of use of, of postnatal steroids to now kind of creeping back into practice where we're trying to define exactly what's the correct steroid, what is the correct dosing, and the time period of exposure. Um, and so a lot of lessons learned in being able to, to avoid sort of jumping in too quickly uh, with something that looked like it had an amazing early success. The other example that I wanted to uh, look back on is our management of the patent ductus arteriosus, which again was something where we felt as neonatologists was important to close this, this fetal vessel and went to uh, any sort of opportunity to have medical or surgical closure because we thought that this was a, a problem for the short-term uh, complications of our infants. And if we fast forward to now, after multiple decades, we learned that um, in fact, a lot of our assumptions were incorrect, and the way we approached it probably early on did not look at long-term effects. And as a result, we, we now have to backpedal on our management. In fact, it sort of eliminate a lot of the medical and surgical management, certainly within the first week of life, knowing now that uh, we may have been causing more harm or certainly not making the situation any, any better. So these are examples where if we look back now, you know, we have to sort of apprise what was the cumulative harm that we may have caused by sort of jumping in uh, sort of head first into those, those situations. And if we had a second chance, what would we do? And when we look at probiotic use in the, in the NICU, clearly there's um, a, a number of questions that have been raised in the prior webinars in terms of the gaps that we don't know, with, what's the correct dose and what's the, you know, what type of probiotics should we use and the timing of the probiotics. Um, I wanted to discuss a couple of areas that uh, are, are highlighted from the data. One is sort of the potentiating effect of uh, the, the feeding that occurs when you're giving the probiotics with, with mother's milk or donor milk, and also the selectivity of the subgroups that, uh, where the benefit is most seen, uh, certainly more so in the older, uh, the larger size babies. And in particular, start raise the concern of, of other possible risks that we may uh, need to be aware of. And so it's important in the backdrop to kind of consider that it's a complex system when we look at the microbiome in the, in the preterm gut, that there's this sort of layering of, of bacteria that increases as it gets to the colon, and that there are a lot of control elements that define how bacteria are sort of residing within the gut. And we know that our preterm babies are, you know, significantly impaired by the way they are born and the immaturity of their gut and how we deal with them when they come in the NICU. And we, we sort of have this story that we say that these infants have a dysbiosis and that our, by giving probiotics that we're somehow ameliorating and reversing or correcting this dysbiosis that occurs and that may be the precursor to setting up for the problem of neck. And the influences on the uh, baby's microbiome can be quite immediate and quite uh, profound and s stories where that uh, where you can just immediately swab a baby with bacteria coming from a mother's vaginal vault can change and restore some of the bacterial colonization and gut flora in a baby so the the imprinting that we have can be quite powerful so what are the effects when we give such profound amounts of bacteria on, over the first few weeks of life? And the relationship of how the feeding uh, is, is uh, with respect to probiotic use has not been really well delineated. In fact, one would have thought that probiotic use would have been great uh, to kind of support formula feeding in that the, that kind of overcomes some of the non-biologic uh, ability of, of formula. But most of the data would actually support that uh, the 
uh, effects of probiotics are actually potentiated in the presence of human milk. A number of studies have shown that there seems to be, it seems to be more effective when infants are human milk fed. And, and that's where uh, it, the data has not been well sort of prospectively delineated so, so that can really separate out the effects of probiotics and the type of feeding. And I raise concern about as we barrel into probiotics that we are, are also need to be aware that the smallest size infants, the extremely low birth rate infants, don't seem to have the, the same kind of benefit as the slightly larger preterm infants. And not much has been explored in terms of mechanism here and the spe specificity of the probiotics and the dosage and the, the use in why we have less effect in the smallest babies who, by the way, are the ones that are the most uh, prone for, uh, for complications. And then uh, two safety concerns that I think often get overlooked. One is that when we treat with a biologic agent like probiotics, we're actually not only treating that uh, patient, that these probiotics have a tendency to spread and may actually influence other patients in the unit, the NICU environment, and potentially even the staff that take care of the babies. And the other concern is that when a labeled uh, product comes to us and it's in the sort of the over-the-counter form, we are uh, uh, apprised of data that suggests that we may not be giving what the label actually says, both in the type and strain of bacteria that we get deliver, as well as the living or dead uh, nature of the, of the uh, product. And that is a quality issue that needs to be you know, greatly um, uh, explored. And the cross-contamination that occurs when probiotics are used in the unit has already been sort of delineated in the literature. And anywhere between eight and 44% of, uh, of uh, probiotics that are used in randomized controlled studies have been shown to jump, hop to infants next door. And, and that has not been well studied from a, in a prospective manner. And it may be of, it, for some it may not be a big concern, but for, some, for others the question is, is it when you're treating one baby, you may be treating other babies in the unit. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? And then more, even more complicated is this idea that we know that the development of the microbiome takes time. And that we go from a plastic, plas plastic nature to a more restrictive nature. So when we introduce bacteria early on and uh, we run the chance of potentially uh, permanently affecting the microbiome. And metabolic studies suggest that even a, sort of a straightforward transfer of, of feces, of stool from one, uh, say an obese mouse to a, a thin mouse can significantly alter the metabolic uh, function of that of that mouse, so this thin mouse can become obese just by having fecal transport, transplant. Uh, and we know that the adult gut microbiome is an important sort of exogenous organ, a forgotten organ as some people call it. And so when we alter the probiotic uh, and the microbiome of the preterm uh, baby, what are the effects of these changes on that infant when they grow up? And how much are we permanently altering their metabolic machinery, either for the in a favorable, favorable way or an unfavorable way. So at this point, I see that we're entering into several different uh, futures, all of which may, be, may not be mutually exclusive. The first uh, possibility is that we're going to start to embrace, and this is already beginning to happen, high quality probiotics that are available to us that are cheaper than, say, a, an FDA approved drug product and that may lend itself to much more rapid adoption. And I look to my, my home country, Canada, where I've seen this really spreading quite uh, rapidly uh, because of their sort of uh, ability to have access to these products. The risk, however, is as, a, as I've raised, is that what, what is this gonna do in terms of um, the overall questions that remain unanswered and how easy will it be when we lose equipoise to being able to answer some of these, these things? And what about measuring those adverse effects and how, how rigidly are people going to be able to do that? And will we know when a lot of babies are treated when adverse effects occur? 
The other pathway which is occurring right now is the availability of IND applications for probiotics available to us and which will be regulated by the FDA in a manner that's very familiar to us as, as, as in the form of drug. And having these available to us would allow us then to have safety and efficacy really well delineated, adverse effects really, really well characterized, and ability to potentially answer some of those unanswered questions in the gap that I mentioned earlier. The downside is that this is going to cost a lot more for us and that the time for implementation, if we're already sort of believers in this, is going to take much, much longer for us to use. And the final option that I see arising is that of prebiotics that are available to us now in the term market. And the, these prebiotics are not living substrates. These are uh, products that can be synthesized chemically and be available to us, maybe even brought in combination with probiotics and create a symbiotic therapy um, and, and maybe, a, maybe a much better uh, a sort of form in terms of pressuring uh, the bacteria uh, in a certain way, but still more research is required. So this is gonna take time uh, to implement uh, if we're going to be waiting for prebiotics to come into our, our mix. And an example of why perhaps prebiotics may be something to, to uh, be thoughtful about is looking at human milk and the sugars that are present. And we did a study in the past to actually look at the characteristics of the sugars that are found in mother's milk and its relationship to neck. And in this study, we found that that as a total, the, the total amount of, of oligosaccharides or these sugars did not seem to have any relationship to NAC. But in fact, when we looked at specific structure, in this case, the DSLNT structure, we found that this correlated with those babies who did not have enough of this sugar seemed to have more incidence of NAC, such that these specific structures of human milk sugars may have very strong specificity for protect for for protecting babies against a disease like neck, as it's shown in the top left corner of this heat map. So the spectrum that we sit on now uh, is one where it's more like a political spectrum, where if you're very conservative, you say we need uh, FDA approved products, we don't have enough data, that there's uh, long-term safety concerns, there's contamination risk and, and misidentity of what we're giving and that we may not really truly understand the efficacy in all the different subgroups, and so more data needs to occur before we move forward. And on the other extreme is one belief where we believe that it's safe to use these products, there's enough evidence, waiting is unethical, and that more data can be acquired even after impl implementation. And I think sitting on this question, we need to be careful of all the things that we don't know and all the risks that we may not have already kind of predicted at this point. Um, in order to be able to um, move forward, either in a more conservative way or in a liberal way, I think we have to be mindful of, uh, of the things of, that are sort of the unknown. And I'll stop there and thank everyone for your attention. Perfect. Well, thank you, Jay. And um, we'll, we'll move on. Um, but please chat in your questions. Um, and um, use the chat box or Q&A. Dr. Kim may have to um, sign off a little early, so we're happy to touch base with, um, with him afterwards and, um, and, and make sure that in, any questions you have are, can be answered. And I think this is a nice segue. I, we wanted to, in the series, touch on the regulation of probiotics. This was a question that came up um, on one of the earlier webinars, and, uh, and there were some questions regarding this. We thought this would be a nice opportunity to briefly go over um, the regulation of probiotics. And, and, um, and, and I'll start by saying this is, this is complex and evolving, um, and, and so um, there, there's likely to be changes in, in different countries regarding how probiotics are regulated. And in the United States, really in 2016, the um, U.S. Food and Drug Administration's regulatory oversight of probiotics kind of falls into two different distinct categories. Um, first is, is regulation, which they have oversight over as a dietary supplement um, or a food. And this is the way that the probiotics that are currently available over the counter um, have kind of oversight by the FDA as, as a um, dietary supplement. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about, about um, 
of dietary supplements. But in 2016, there was a new category that um, was created that is, was termed live biotherapeutic product which was a regulatory pathway um, of, of treating these probiotics um, as live biotherapeutic products under more of a drug regulatory pathway. And so these are the two current um, ways that, that in the United States probiotics can be regulated. And so how about as a dietary supplement? So a dietary supplement is a, is a product that's taken by mouth that has a dietary ingredient that's intended to supplement the diet. There's a large market of these, whether it's um, probiotics, which are, are currently sold in the United States as dietary supplements or, or vitamins or, or other uh, minerals that all fall within this category of supplementing your diet with, um, with um, ingredients that are already available and, and which have been consumed. Even with dietary supplements, the FDA does provide some guidance to manufacturers regarding good manufacturing practices that um, um, are intended to, to guide um, manufacturers in, in kind of the production of these supplements. And these dietary supplements can make claims about how the, the product affects the structure or function of the body um, without FDA approval. For example, um, that it may increase, taking your probiotic may increase the number of these bacteria in your stool or, or may, may alter the number of stools you have. For example, those would be kind of fall under examples of structure function claims. But they can't make claims that the product, um, specifically here for net, can reduce the risk of a disease without the FDA consent. And that's the big limitation of, of where dietary supplements can't, can't make claims about the treatment or prevention or mitigation of a disease uh, without the FDA consent. And to do that, the the probiotic would have to fall into the second regulatory cat category, which is a live biotherapeutic product. And this is um, really focused on if a probiotic is marketed as a drug for the prevention of a disease, for example, NEC, th then in this situation, there would be much more stringent requirements. For this, the probiotic would have to be proven to be safe and effective for its intended use through clinical trials, and then receive FDA approval before it can be sold and marketed as a drug to prevent NAC. Um, there is some guidance that um, the, the FDA has provided regarding information to assure that there's proper identification, quality, purity, um, consistency, and strength of the investigational drug. And this bar tends to be um, higher than what, what would be put forward for um, probiotics and dietary supplements. Um, currently in the United States, at least as of 2018, there were no approved live biotherapeutic products as probiotics, and that is, um, one of the challenges is currently there, if, if a clinician wanted to use this for the prevention of neck, there's, there's not one available, but there is a company that is um, in the process of, of um, pursuing this pathway with a probiotic, um, the goal to prevent NEC. So this is a rather new regulatory pathway that tried to address some of the challenges um, with, with kind of the traditional drug pathway um, and, um, and currently not, not one approved as Dr. Kim mentioned, but potentially in the, in the future as these trials get done. How about outside the United States? I know we have an international audience and I just wanted to touch on some other um, countries and how they approach pro probiotics. Dr. Kim mentioned Canada. So in Canada, there's a separate regulatory pathway where probiotic is a licensed health product. And so these um, probiotics have been assessed by Health Canada and found to be safe, effective, and of high quality um, under the recommended conditions of use. And um, in the European Union, it's um, a little di different. And in some countries, the term, actually, the term probiotic is considered a health claim. And so that, that actually, that term can't be used to characterize um, probiotics. And, and in other countries, for example, in Brazil, probiotics are considered functional foods. So I think there's not a, um, there's not symmetry across, um, across the world in how these are considered. Um, there are some kind of pathways in the U.S. where um, dietary supplements that meet or commercially available supplements that meet certain quality criteria can be um, can can be assessed um, as a live biotherapy product and um, and so I think this is an area where the, it's likely as the growth of dietary supplements and probiotics increases that there may be some some changes internationally so regulation of probiotics 
um, it, it's complex. And I think um, in 2016 was an example of kind of how it had evolved in the United States. And, and with fecal transplantation in the United States, I think continue these live microbial, microbial, microbial therapies may continue to, to change. Um, but but this, these regulations really are um, focused on the marketing of these products um, for specific health claims, such as the prevention of that. But, but there are no regulations currently that actually prevent clinicians from supplementing probiotics to infants, whether it be for the prevention of neck um, sepsis or, or mortality, um, just as, as clinicians often use medications that are um, not approved by the FDA for use in, in infants. And, um, so I hope that provides a very brief overview into the um, regulatory environment. And, uh, and with that, we'll, we'll transition to, um, to Adam Mason, who's gonna go into our next topic. I, I, on the slides, um, slide deck that will be shared after this, there, there are some resources and, and references to, to some of the content I, I covered today. Hope everybody can hear me okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking with everyone today. My name is Adam Mason, and uh, as Jennifer said, I am an attorney uh, at Shipman and Goodwin based in Connecticut. I've had the privilege of representing Yale New Haven Hospital and Yale University physicians for the last several years in cases involving necrotizing enterocolitis. And as I'm sure this audience is aware, the case involving the death of a neonate due to a contaminated probiotic. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking with everybody today, and I thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk about this important subject. Um, and I'm trying to advance to my next slide. There we go. Uh, those are my disclaimers. Most importantly, I, I'm not permitted to talk about information that's specific to Yale. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is informed consent, and I mean that from a legal perspective. Uh, I'm not here to talk about ethics, or whether something is medically required or necessary, acceptable or appropriate. Um, your institutions may have policies that um, would be implicated by any sort of conversation that you may have with patients. Um, I would also add that informed consent is different, whether something uh, is different is a different consideration as to whether or not a practical discussion is uh, worth, worth having. The questions I'm going to help answer are, is it legal to have this conversation and is it legally required? The law of informed consent, just to give you a brief history, um, was summarized initially by Judge Cardozo, a very famous judge, who basically said that in the context of surgery, every human being of adult years and sound mind has a right to determine what shall be done with his own body. Uh, that principle has been expanded over the years to uh, areas outside of surgery. We'll talk about that. But it's also worth noting that courts like the Supreme Court of Connecticut have recognized that the conversations that you have with patients uh, do contain limitations, most notably that you're speaking with lay people and that you don't want to overburden patients with immaterial information that they might find confusing, information that, that may scare them into not uh, proceeding with an intervention that they might otherwise or should otherwise uh, engage in. Uh, so there are limitations on the conversations that you, you can have for purposes of informed consent law. Um, when I speak about informed consent, I'm speaking about a cause of action or a legal claim. Sometimes it's called lack of informed consent Sometimes it's called negligent failure to provide adequate informed consent. Uh, it varies slightly from state to state. Um, the state law typically governs the elements of a lack of informed consent claim. But for our purposes today, it's important to understand what does not constitute informed consent as a legal matter. So if you really love probiotics and you think they're wonderful and you wanna tell your patients about them, that you're doing them, that they're an option. That may be a great conversation to have, but by and of itself, that does not constitute an informed consent conversation. Um, similarly, providing an information sheet uh, may or may not, but probably does not constitute what would really be considered a legally valid informed consent 
uh, conversation. This set, the question as to whether or not you have a duty to provide informed consent and whether you've done something that breaches that duty is a separate question from whether or not providing this information is ethical, appropriate, uh, whether it's easy to do, whether it's hospital policy, or whether it's just a nice thing to do to give parents information about um, probiotics. What constitutes the elements of a legal claim? First, is there a duty to provide informed consent? Did the provider breach that duty in some way uh, by providing a discussion that was invalid or inadequate for purposes of providing informed consent? Was there a failure? Was the failure to obtain informed consent a cause of the injury? And then what, if any, damages did the breach cause? I'm gonna focus on the first three prongs of this in the brief discussion that we have today. Uh, so the first question is, is there a legal duty to provide informed consent? Uh, in the context of surgery, blood transfusions, there is usually an obligation to provide an informed consent discussion. Uh, in the context of pharmaceuticals, that law is developing. Many states have yet to recognize a duty to obtain informed consent in the pharmaceutical space. However, the law seems to be emerging in the direction that informed consent would apply to pharmaceuticals. There is almost no law on informed consent relating to nutritional supplements. And the case that I was involved in with Yale, I believe is the only case, at least with a published opinion, uh, that relates to probiotics. So in the context of the case that I was involved with, the court found when we filed a motion to dismiss, which is a motion early on in a case, before you get into the substance of the, the uh, factual elements, the factual claims, that the complaint in that case alleged a viable claim because probiotics were alleged to be part of a medical protocol. Given the fact that probiotics were alleged to be used in this case to prevent a disease, namely neck, the court found that that implicates the concept of informed consent. But the court went on to hold that whether or not the lack of informed consent claim would survive in the long term would depend upon the facts of the case. So at least this court recognized that whether probiotics required informed consent or whether informed consent was required to be given in the context of that specific patient were uh, claims that needed to be proven down the road and could not be established uh, as a matter of law. And the court recognized in this context that it may be necessary to require a plaintiff, in this case a patient, to show that the risk of harm at issue was created or heightened by something specific to this particular patient's medical needs or condition rather than as opposed to being a background risk. Uh, what that actually meant and how that would have played out had the case proceeded to trial is a little unclear. We never quite got that far, fortunately, in our case, uh, but the court did recognize at least that this could be a case-specific question as to whether or not there is a duty to provide informed consent. So if we assume that there is a duty for purposes of this conversation, that a, a provider does have a duty to provide informed consent, what would constitute a valid and adequate informed consent discussion? In the case that I was involved with, these were the allegations that were made. This was what the plaintiff alleged should have been told to the parents about probiotics, not because it was a good idea or not because the parents, it would have helped to the parents to know this information, but they claimed that the doctors should be liable for negligence by not providing this information. And as we proceeded to investigate the case, we believed that there were valid defenses to each one of these allegations. Uh, I, I will not spend the time going through all of those today, but um, we believe that all of those were, were defensible. Um, there are two key aspects to providing a valid and adequate informed consent. One is the information has to be accurate, and that requires testimony from a medical expert as to risks, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then the second aspect is it has, the risk information has to be a material to the decision making. And the law raises the question of who decides what is material. And we'll talk about that in a second. Accurate medical information relating to a risk would discuss the nature of the procedure, 
the hazards and risks, alternatives, and anticipated benefits. The most important prong for lack of informed consent is hazards and risks, because if there are no hazards and risks, then there is no duty to provide informed consent. So the key medical question that needs to be established through the use of a medical expert is are there any known material risks? Each one of those words has a meaning, a legal meaning. Are there any known material risks of using probiotics to prevent neck? And we have to take a hard look at the science to understand whether there are known risks. Uh, Dr. Kim earlier spoke about gaps in data. Uh, there, there may be a lot that we don't know about uh, probiotics. Gaps in data for purposes of the law, it will be very difficult to establish that a gap in data by itself constitutes a known material risk. That doesn't mean it's a bad idea to find out about them though. So who decides what is a known, whether a known risk is material? It could be a reasonable medical provider. It could be the actual doctor in the case. It could be a reasonable patient or parent or the actual parent in the case. And the law in every state is either one or the other of a reasonable patient or parent standard or the actual patient or parent standard. That does not mean that the doctor's opinions about what should have been said or not said are not relevant evidence. They absolutely are relevant evidence. But the standard to decide what is material is a patient standard, whether it is the actual patient in the case or a reasonable patient. This is important because if your center is considering whether or not to provide informed consent, the, it's helpful to understand how that informed consent dialogue is going to be judged by the law. And obviously you don't have a specific patient or parent in front of you when you're making a policy. And so it would be helpful to understand whether or not your state requires a reasonable patient or parent standard, because that is likely to be the standard by which your policy will be judged. Um, some suggested questions that you may wanna ask in formulating a policy. The key is reasonableness. Would parents reasonably reject probiotics based upon a reasonable view of medically accurate information? Or would telling them about probiotics cause them to unreasonably reject probiotics? Would, be the, would they be scared away? Finally, the last prong that we'll talk about today is was the failure to obtain informed consent a cause of the injury? The law all, always requires causation. And in this case, if a parent would have, re, would have heard a, a valid and adequate informed consent discussion and had decided to proceed with using probiotics anyway, then there would be no causation in that case because the, the baby still would have received probiotics even absent the informed consent discussion. In litigating uh, our case, and this is admittedly unscientific, we came across many, many different centers using many different approaches to how it is they discussed probiotics with parents. Uh, it ran the gamut from no discussion at all, it was considered routine treatment, uh, standard of care, uh, along the lines of many other things that NICUs do without discussing uh, those with parents. Uh, information sheets, which contained a wide variety of information, um, Information sheets given only if the parents ask questions, information sheets that are included as part of a, a hospital packet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all the way down to really written consent as part of research. What I didn't see, what I didn't hear about was a written consent form that a parent had to sign before probiotics were administered. Uh, that is not something that I came across. If your center is doing that, I would love to hear about it. We can talk about that at the um, Next Society meeting next month, where I will we'll be speaking with Dr. Matthew Bizarro uh, about the case that we were involved in, in more detail. But there are a wide variety of approaches to providing information to parents right now. Uh, what we also did not come across, I should mention, is really parents who rejected probiotics after hearing about it. And there may be many reasons for that, but Virtually every physician that I spoke to about this told me that even if they had a discussion with parents about probiotics, the parents did not reject probiotics. So the questions that you should ask yourself uh, for purposes of informed consent, should you talk to your parents about probiotics at all? 
Do you believe there's a known medical risk? What would a reasonable parent do with accurate medical information? And what is the right way to talk about the benefits and the risks based upon the known science? So to get back to my original questions, uh, is it legal to have a conversation about probiotics? Of course it is. Of course it's legal. Is it legally required? That is an open question in the law. Uh, I would suggest to you, however, that there are a number of factors that would indicate that probably probiotics have not reached the level where it is legally required to provide informed consent. Those factors include the following. And again, this is, this is my opinion as a, as a lawyer, and I'm certainly not gonna tell you what to do as a doctor, but uh, number one, the FDA does in fact regulate probiotics. Dr. Patel uh, did a nice job summarizing some of those regulations. There does appear to be strong benefit evidence. Um, as a lawyer, when I see meta-analyses and randomized controlled trials and large cohort studies reaching the same or similar conclusions over and over again, I really like that because that points in a, in a positive direction. We don't always see that in the cases that I deal with. And this is, a, a, in many ways, a unique situation where you have that level of um, scientific support for an intervention. Uh, we did come across case reports of bacteremia. However, there were no serious adverse events associated with those. Um, of course, there was the one serious contamination issue. That product was recalled, the lot was recalled, and the product is no longer being marketed. Uh, are there alternatives to probiotics? I think Dr. Kim and others would suggest that there might be. Um, is there a benefit or are there risks to your uh, NICU microbiome? Those are considerations that you would want to think about. And is having a conversation, is elevating this to a conversation with parents um, something that might scare them um, unnecessarily? Those are some of the considerations. Um, so with that, um, I know I've only had 15 minutes and it's, it's a very complicated question. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of law. I'll be looking forward to meeting many of you at the next society meeting uh, next month, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much for your time. Awesome. Thanks so much, Adam. That was really fantastic. Um, I think I'm going to just jump right into my slides, if that's okay, Ravi. And then we'll be sure to save time at the end for questions um, and chat. Yeah, I think it'd be nice to have the kind of wait till the end and, um, and then do the question. Okay. All right, great. So I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. All right, so I'm going to be um, exploring some strategies that we hope will help to empower and provide information to families on probiotics as well as just probiotics um, and human milk and neck in general. Um, so I first want to start by sharing a photo of my son, Micah. Um, this photo was taken when he was six weeks old, just a couple of days before he developed necrotized enterocolitis. And when we took this photo of Micah, he had already doubled his birth weight. He was beginning to nurse and he looked like, and I'm sure you would agree, that he would be discharged home to us in just a, a couple of weeks. He was doing quite well. Um, but tragically, he developed necrotized enterocolitis. He went into renal failure because of it, and he became severely fluid overloaded to the point where he couldn't even open his eyes. And so I'm going to flip back to this one. I want to um, share these photos with you for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that I had no idea that Micah was even at risk of NAC. Um, I had never heard of the disease, and I was truly desperate for information, but I didn't even know what questions to ask and where to begin. And so I really wish someone had taken the time to talk to me about NEC, as well as the potential risks and the perfect protective factors um, long before my baby was actually being diagnosed with this disease. Um, and the second reason I wanted to share these two photos with you is um, because we asked Micah's care team if he could receive probiotics. This was seven years ago, so um, quite a while ago when they were born. Um, Micah is a twin. And, um, Mike, the care team's answer, um, or whether Micah actually received the probiotics is actually irrelevant to the point that I'd like to make. And what mattered to us is how we, as Micah's um, engaged, devoted parents were made to feel after simply asking a question. And so that's kind of what I want to get to is the process over the end practice. And um, we were made 
in my opinion, we felt ashamed for just asking and posing the question. And, and so again, it's not about what decision was ultimately made on whether to utilize probiotics, um, but we feel like parents really need to be engaged and informed in, in, throughout the process of getting to that choice on probiotic use. And so that the parents are buying into the decision and are in, authentically part of the decision-making process and they feel good about the choice that's being made for their baby and, um, and feel like they're part of the care team because while we cannot eliminate the risks of neck right now, we certainly can eliminate the risk um, of making families feel ashamed and uninformed and, and powerless. So um, kind of want to emphasize that point is uh, the process of, of getting to the decisions around probiotics. Um, and I want to encourage us to view parents as partners in care. Um, they should be valued and treated as part of the care team. But before we can get there, we need to establish trust and rapport. And so some uh, strategies include empathy, validating their feelings of, regarding their experiences and the trauma that they're going through, um, being consistent and um, like continuity of care, for example, is very helpful. And just transparency are truly fundamental to building trust and rapport with um, NICU families. And most parents in the NICU, I'd say, are um, really, truly desperate for opportunities to contribute in a meaningful way to their baby's care and to the baby's care team. Um, and, you know, this hospitalization that they're going through will likely affect them for the rest of their lives. And so I um, really want to encourage us to engage the parents as much as we possibly can. Um, and of course, listening and being responsive sounds like a no-brainer, but uh, so many of us NICU parents report feeling disregarded and even belittled by our baby's care team. Um, and it's really important for us to build parents up um, and help NICU parents feel confident and empowered because that's what's best for the baby, right? We want the parents to feel um, confident and feel like they know what they're doing. And so we just ask that providers listen and empathetically respond um, to parents. And finally, um, it's really critical for the entire multidisciplinary NICU team to value parents. Um, and the care team should see themselves as mentors to the parents. And so the nurses, the RTs, the social workers, everyone that's coming into contact with the family, um, can have, they have so much to offer to NICU parents. Um, so I think if we can build a culture in the NICU that not nurtures not just the baby, but also the baby's family and the parents is um, incredibly helpful. Um, <clears throat> I'd say most NICU parents are eager um, and maybe even desperate to learn how they become a more effective informed parent. Um, I would say most NICU parents were not um, planning to be in the NICU with their baby and so they are learning this as they go. Um, they really want to understand um, and be given more information and when, when information is provided in a way that's compassionate um, and effective, it really is empowering for families and it helps them to prepare for their journey ahead and gives them some uh, sense of predictability and understanding. And most NICU families, I would say, do not find it overwhelming, further overwhelming to um, have more information. They find it helpful so that they can better advocate for their baby. Um, <clears throat> it's also important to acknowledge um, that these parents are experiencing a trauma and and so as much as possible, if we could provide information in several different ways um, from several different providers, it's going to be helpful for these families to be able to um, retain and, and process this information. And again, as I mentioned, um, just doing our best to mentor um, and coach parents and building up their knowledge base so that they can contribute to um, their baby's care and just as part of the care team. So what do NICU parents want to know? Um, and I guess I would kind of flip this around and say, like, ask yourself, this, if, if this was your child, what would you want to know? Um, but, you know, I've spoken with hundreds of NICU families um, around the world, and I would say most, if not all of us, want to know about NAC. We want to know that our baby's at risk of this disease. We also want to know about the potential risks and protective factors that are associated with the disease, such as probiotics, um, because we really want to know how we can better advocate and help care for our baby. Um, and most importantly, we really want to uh, be part of the decision-making process. Um, we don't want to make the decisions, but we want to be part of that process and feel heard and valued so we can make work with our baby's care team and make these decisions together. 
Um, and then finally, um, some strategies around informing families around pro about probiotics, um, building trust and rapport by talking with parents about neck, breast milk, and probiotics, um, using the Next Society's resources. I'm gonna show you one in a second, um, but these resources have been um, developed by NICU parents um, with oversight from our Scientific Advisory Council. So um, we feel like this information is not only accurate, but what NICU parents really want and need to, to know and to hear. Um, we also encourage you to listen authentically, be responsive, um, and answer questions not just with compassion, but also with resources. And so being able to direct families to websites, to articles, and to other organizations that are doing this work where they can um, learn and explore at their own pace and then co hopefully come back to you with follow-up questions and, and more discussion, I think is really helpful. So here's the Next Society's um, one-page info sheet on probiotics, breast milk, and neck. Um, we would love for you to use it. Uh, it's available on our website. Um, and I want to emphasize that we feel like information and resources like this should be provided uh, not just verbally, but also like in writing. And, um, and so we're talking to families and with families about uh, the, dish, the various um, protective and uh, risk factors that are involved. Um, so it's just helpful for families to receive information in a variety of ways that they can uh, retain this information and refer back to it at a later time. Um, and then thinking on a, a broader kind of larger scale about ways that we can empower families and help provide them with information about probiotics. Um, if your, fam if your NICU has a patient family advisory committee, that's a great place to start is learning from their thoughts and suggestions. And if your center doesn't have a patient family advisory committee, then uh, you might consider working on that because your individual NICU families can provide you with truly relevant localized insight and guidance. And so we really encourage you to use um, your NICU families and as you develop these policies and um, different care practices and, and get their thoughts and insight. Um, we also hope that you'll consider engaging your post-NICU families in um, whatever research you might be doing. And so that's a big kind of goal of the next society is to do um, and, and to drive patient-centered research. And it just helps our work uh, and the implications of our work um, ensure that it matters to um, our patients and our families. So I um, hope you'll consider engaging pa like patient families in your research as well. Um, and finally, just engaging your multidisciplinary care team and building a culture that authentically values and mentors parents um, because it's just a critical part of empowering them and providing them with information and giving them the skills and information that they need to contribute in a meaningful way. Um, and then I finally just want to share um, some photos of the babies um, that have passed away and their families are very actively engaged in the next society. So this is Brooks, McKenna, Leiden, Sarah, Tom, and Micah. Um, they all lost their lives to neck and the next society is comprised of hundreds of families with babies just like these little guys here. Um, we're committed to building a world without this disease and I think it's just fundamental for us to advocate for NICU parents so that they have the information that they need to help care for their baby and help contribute uh, in a meaningful way to, to this work that we're all doing. So thank you for to each of you on this webinar, to all of our presenters um, for working on behalf of babies um, like these guys you see here. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Mark. But um... So while Robbie's pulling that up, I'll just uh, let you know um, first my thanks to Jen for that uh, powerful presentation. I wanted to just finish this webinar um, and, and close out the series by talking briefly about a Next Society sponsored probiotic quality improvement project. Uh, this is something that you'll find uh, details on the, um, the Next Society website. If you go to the Clinicians tab and then click on the tab that says low quality, excuse me, low cost quality improvement projects, uh, you can find the details there. Uh, Ravi, next slide please. Uh, as you all know, um, the big question in front of us is why haven't uh, large clinical trials of probiotics been performed in the U.S.? As you know, the the two largest studies of probiotics, randomized controlled trials with more than a thousand preemies, were done in the UK and in Australia and New Zealand. And cohort studies that include more than a thousand preemies have been published from a variety of countries across the globe, mostly in Europe and Canada, but none from the US. And that sort of leads us to those uh, challenges that Ravi raised regarding um, the, the challenges of obtaining uh, FDA approval for current products. The key knowledge gap that, that I see is we have lots of cohort studies and randomized controlled trials um, comparing probiotics to placebo, but what we really need next are comparisons of different probiotics 
and different doses. And this um, proposed uh, QI project is perhaps a way to get at that uh, question. Uh, next slide, Ravi. So the, the project that the Next Society is proposing is that we have um, NICUs across the world, not just in the US, share their data. And so eligible NICUs would be any NICU that has made the decision after reviewing the literature that they're going to offer routine probiotic administration to premature infants. And what we would love to have you share is your data from EPIC-1, where um, the 18 months prior to routine probiotic administration, and then EPIC-2, which is the 18 months after initiation of routine probiotic administration. Our primary exposure, of course, will be the probiotic strain, dose, and duration. Secondary exposures that will be important to um, share will be feeding type, whether it's breast milk, um, donor pasteurized donor human milk or formula, and the number of antibiotic days for each uh, baby. The primary outcome for this QI project is weight gain, and there's a reason for that. Secondary outcomes would be necrotizing enterocolitis, death, sepsis, including sepsis related to the probiotic product itself, days to full enteral nutrition, TPN days, and length of hospital stay. Uh, next slide. So our goal would be to have 100 NICUs across the country share data on babies who are very low birth weight and who receive um, either probiotics in EPOC 2 or no probiotics in EPOC 1 in each of 100 NICUs with the goal of including 10,000 premature infants. And that would allow us to make comparison. A study that big, a cohort study that big, would be adequately powered to make comparisons between probiotic products and between different doses. And so we're hopeful that as NICUs make that decision or for those NICUs that already have, that you'd be willing to go back and share some data with the next society that then we can collate and share with the rest of the world. An alternative strategy for data collection would be to use the existing infrastructure. So for instance, we would be very open to exploring the idea of just using the data that you're already submitting to um, databases like Vaughn or the California CPQCC uh, database or other state databases or databases in, in Europe and other places as a way to get at this data. Another alternative approach, of course, I'm very excited, as uh, Dr. Kim mentioned, about a company, Infant Bacterial Therapeutics, who has invested an incredible amount of energy and time to bring their probiotic, it's a strain of Lactobacillus reuteri, uh, under FDA guidance through the investigational new drug um, mechanism to um, clinical trials. They've completed their phase two study and they're now preparing to begin their phase three study. So if you're a NICU that would be willing to participate in that randomized controlled trial, I would encourage you to contact Infant Bacterial Therapeutics or the PI of the study, Dr. Joseph New. Uh, the alternative, um, the appealing thing about that alternative, of course, is that we do need more US data, and this is a product that will have FDA oversight. The drawback, of course, is that I'm convinced that we have lots of data about randomized controlled trials comparing a probiotic to a placebo. And so the alternative strategy we're proposing here of a multi-NICU QI project would be allow us to get at the more key question of which probiotic and which dose is the most effective. Um, next uh, slide, please, Robbie. So finally, I just want to leave you with um, a link there um, where we would love to have you uh, click on this link, um, follow that link, uh, copy it and paste it so that you can give us some evaluation of this three webinar series, some feedback as to how we might go forward, your thoughts in general. Uh, and with that, I'll finish my presentation. Uh, we, we are right at the hour now, but we would be happy to stay online and answer questions submitted either through the Q&A box or through the, um, the uh, chat box. And with that, I'll, I'll yield uh, back to um, Ravi. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mark. We, we have a couple of questions that um, have been chatted in through the Q&A box. And the first one I think would be um, maybe for you, Mark, to answer, which is, are there any known organizations um, testing over-the-counter probiotic products in the U.S. for accurate labeling, efficacy, shelf life, um, and so on? 
so I know that there are published uh, studies looking at common uh, common probiotic products that we that have been purchased over the counter. Uh, I've been in part of two of those here at UC Davis over the years where we've looked at products that you could just pick up on the shelf and tested them for a number of viable organisms and whether what's in the in the product matches what's on the label. Uh, there are other studies as well. In terms of the, the question here as to whether there's a, a group in the U.S. that oversees that degree, I'm not aware of of um, ongoing oversight in that area. Uh, one of the um, bits of information in, uh, at the Next Society um, website, again, under that um, low cost QI initiative uh, tab, uh, includes some products that we have tested um, and found them to be um, high in quality in terms of what's on the label is exactly um, um, represented in the study in the product itself and that the number of viable organisms match nicely um, again I don't have any um, financial interest here in any product we just shared uh, on the website some products that we had tested and found to be um, highly reliable thanks mark and the second question which touches on on growth um, is um, chatted in by um, Somebody asking about um, clinical effects of robotics other than um, affecting neck incidents like growth, uh, maturation, and complications like BPD. So any thoughts on, on that? Well, there are some nice meta-analysis looking at other outcomes. So um, I think that has been a very valuable uh, addition to the literature. So, so far people have looked at BPD and retinopathy of prematurity and found no difference between the kiddos who got the probiotic and the kids who didn't. Um, the other um, question about weight gain, I think, is a compelling one. The reason we decided to use weight gain uh, as our primary outcome for this Next Society QI project is recognizing the FDA's guidance that a food is something that you take because of its taste or its nutritional value. And so it's possible to um, to characterize a probiotic as a food. And in that case, um, you know, the key question is, does it help you gain weight if it has nutritional value? And the studies are mixed. There are studies that have demonstrated improved uh, weight gain, um, and there are other studies that have shown absolutely no difference. And so we'd like to shed further light on, on that important question through this QI project, um, in addition to reporting all those other secondary outcomes that I mentioned. Uh, in terms of um, neurodevelopmental outcome, there are studies now that have um, shared the two-year, 18-month to two-year neurodevelopmental outcome of babies who got uh, probiotics versus babies who didn't in the randomized trials. And those studies published to date have not shown any difference. So no improved neurodevelopmental outcome and no worsening of neurodevelopmental outcome. Um, and I'll stop there. Thanks, Mark. And I, I had a question. Um, <laughs> Both, I think, both to Adam and to Jennifer, and regarding how we can engage parents with the issue of consent. I know, Adam, in your presentation, you mentioned um, that really the the kind of parents and the patient families are, are the ones in which the um, kind of expectations around consent would really fall into into that domain, as opposed to a reasonable clinician um, and kind of the importance of, of the parents' input in that. So, I wonder if you could share thoughts on. On, on how, how to go about when you're deciding on, on kind of what a reasonable parent would, would, uh, would expect regarding consent? Uh, you know, my, my thought is there's, there's so much, as a lawyer, I, I tend to want to defer to what I've been told by clinicians. And so many clinicians who I've spoken with about this have told me that, you know, either one of two things, either probiotics they consider to be essentially a very significant, important treatment, uh, preventative treatment. And um, there's so much of what goes on in a NICU that parents are not regularly informed about. Um, and so on one hand, because it's an emerging, potentially an emerging benefit, um, it's an interesting subject. Um, and as, as Jennifer pointed out, if there, 
if parents are not being well informed about the risk of NEC, then having a discussion about probiotics is certainly something you may very well want to do. Um, on the other hand, like everything else that goes on in a NICU, um, there, you have to make a decision as to whether or not to elevate it to that point. And do you talk about it in a way that is going to unnecessarily scare a parent away from probiotics if you believe that probiotics should be used? Uh, I, I would point to the the summary that Jennifer uh, had shown earlier about probiotics, I thought that was actually a very good, reasonable summary of what the science showed um, and very consistent with some of the information sheets that I've seen uh, handed out. So uh, maybe that's a good, a good approach, but I think the clinicians really need to be the ones deciding uh, how best to talk about it with parents. I, I can have a couple comments. Um, one, I, I want to just address the notion that more information scares or further overwhelms families. Um, for all the families that I have ever talked to about this, um, that is not the case. Families are really desperate for information and it helps them um, become more informed, empowered, and able to contribute. And so as long as this information is provided in a compassionate, sensitive, um, you know, open and honest way, um, families want more information because when they are just lost and uninformed and don't know what questions to ask, they're not gonna be able to engage as effectively in the care team. Um, so there's that. And again, if, if um, providers and clinicians in you know, these localized NICUs aren't sure what to do, then I would really encourage them to develop a patient family advisory committee within their center and made up of their post-NICU graduate families. Bring those families back and learn from them because I think they can offer your center a lot of localized, um, relevant insight and guidance. So um, I'd really encourage everyone to bring in um, your NICU families and, and help them be part of the process and so you can be more effective, you know, with new inpatient NICU families. And, and just to echo that point, Jennifer, I, and I, I don't mean to imply that doctors would have a conversation that wouldn't necessarily scare families. And in yeah. fact, in all of the discussions I had with physicians who did share information about probiotics, they consistently told me hundreds of parents never once rejected them. Right. So it's certainly possible to have that conversation without Right. without scaring parents. Right. And I, I, again, it's that process really that matters, I think, most. It's not the decision that's, I mean, of course, the ultimate decision whether or not to use them is important. Clearly, that's important. But it's what's, I think, even more important is the process of getting to that decision and making sure that families and parents feel like they are part of that process and they have bought in to the decision that's going to be made. Um, we have a question here um, about um, given that cross, so thank you both for that. I think that's um, very important and I think the Next Society offers a nice forum for um, really being able to engage a lot of families and so um, we hope to kind of continue the conversation at the, at the meeting um, in a few weeks. I wanted to move to the next question, which was on, given that cross-contamination occurs in 37% of patients after a two-week NICU stay, and this is based on the um, PIPS trial um, by Kate Costello and colleagues in the UK. Should all families in a NICU be made aware that the um, NICU is, is um, that they're using probiotics in the NICU? And um, I, I, I will at least share my thoughts and I, I, Mark may want to share um, his thoughts as well. You know, I, I think when we look at what infants are being exposed to, you know, the, the hospitals, many hospitals are, I think there's a balance between these um, probiotic bacteria, but also pathogens that are often surrounding um, infants. So we shouldn't think of a NICU as a sterile environment. And, and I um, have not yet seen any data to show that there's harm from, um, from cross-colonization, um, particularly in NICUs as, as, as opposed to a trial where all infants would presumably be treated with a protocol. Um, but I, I do think in certain circumstances, um, there, there, there could potentially be a risk. But Mark, I don't know if you have thoughts. Um, as far as I know, there's not been any um, anything that I'm aware of that's shown harm from cross colonization. Um, from yeah, I agree. I, I think one of the questions we we still don't have a great answer for is dose. And so when we measure, and and we've done that in some of our studies, when we measure whether there's cross contamination, what we're seeing is we can find small amounts of the probiotic microbe in the poop of a baby who didn't get the probiotic microbe. 
whether that's enough to have any impact or protective effect on that baby is still unclear. I'd agree with your statement. There are a lot of things that are happening in the NICU that are influencing the baby's gut microbiota. That includes um, microbes that live on surfaces and microbes that are resistant to our cleaning agents. That includes um, when we give babies antibiotics, that has an impact on that baby's microbiota and potentially on babies around that microbiome, uh, around that baby. Uh, the same is true if you think back to um, Jay's slide with the left like a bullseye. Whenever we do something to one baby, it impact, impacts the microbiota of not just that baby, but likely other babies and staff providers. That's not just probiotics, that's likely antibiotics and H2 blockers and cleaning agents and skin to skin time. Uh, and it extends not just to bacteria, but to viruses. And so there's, a, there's so much that's influencing this community of microbes within the gut that trying to single out one as um, a primary influence is, is pretty tough. To the question, I think uh, transparency and sharing as much information with um, families as they're willing and interesting to, interested in receiving is a great um, principle. So sometimes parents who have read the research and know of our concerns about NEC are interested in questions like, my baby's not a premature baby, but is at risk because he has gastroschisis or because he has heart disease or because um, he had a hypoxic injury to his brain and gut, should we be using probiotics for those babies? So having discussions with interested parents, even if it's a, a, a less high risk situation, I think is welcomed by most families and, and helpful. Um, how far do you go? I think depends on the level of interest of the family, personally. Thanks, Mark. And I would just add, I think we run into a similar scenario with antibiotics um, where, you know, we are treating infants with antibiotics and potentially the cho choice and approach to antibiotics may influence the profile of um, bacteria in a, in a unit. And I think we often, um, you know, that's not something we often discuss about in infants in the NICU are receiving or, or types of, of um, bacteria, but I, I do think it's an important conversation to have. We have another question, which is, um, is potential explanations for the greater effect of probiotics in the higher weight premature infants than the smallest ones um, that have the highest risk of neck? So I'll, um, I'll share, you know, my thoughts. If you look at, um, if you look at the trials and you look at the estimates, even in the infants less than a thousand grams, the, the point estimates do, su do suggest are going the same direction as the as the overall effects um, of probiotics in, in kind of the broader preterm population, but are, are, are diminished. Having said, there has been a large um, study, cohort study out of um, Germany that enrolled a large number of infants less than 1,000 grams that did show a benefit. And it, and it may be that certain treatments, co-treatments in the smallest infants, for example, antibiotic use, uh, may, may potentially influence or, or diminish the effect but I'm, I'm always cautious about looking at subgroup analysis. When you're looking at the effect of an intervention, for example, probiotics, that's been studied across a broad group of preterm infants. I think you should, it's generally favorable to look at that, that larger population than really picking certain subgroups um, because often those, those groups are, it's under power to look and say, is there really a, a, a true benefit mm -hmm. in only one group and not the other? Um, so I, I tend to focus on the overall effects rather than in particular subgroups. Um, but Mark, any, any thoughts on, on that question? No, I agree completely. I think, you know, the very early studies raised the question of whether the risk of infection actually might be higher with probiotics um, who, in babies who are less than a kilo. And over time, that's clearly become um, it's become evident that that's not true. And so I'm reassured by the multiple studies um, that have not shown worsening uh, in the ELBWs. And I, I think the, the main challenge is going to be to continue to um, acquire as much data and share as much data as we can so that we can, we can answer those kind of questions. From my review of the literature, I agree with you. I think the best study we have is that large German cohort study that did show benefit. 
The final question we have is, uh, is should probiotic treatment be terminated um, if there's a suspicion of neck that arises? So, so we typically have, um, in our unit, we've been using probiotics for several years, and we typically have stopped giving the probiotic when the baby has been started on antibiotics. And that's mostly based on um, the evidence we have that when you start an antibiotic, it pretty quickly wipes out the, the probiotic from the stool. And so if you're treating someone with an antibiotic, there's probably no benefit in that moment of giving the probiotic at the same time. Um, whether putting that probiotic uh, into the baby's stomach will make things worse, it's a little hard to say. Uh, the best evidence I have there is actually, we did a small gastroschisa study, and what we found that as long as the babies had a suction tube to suction in the stomach, what we did in that study was we put the probiotic in the stomach and then we clamped it for an hour, and then when we unclamped it, the evidence that we found said that the probiotic just got sucked right back up. So if you think your baby has knack and you're stopping feedings and putting in a suction tube and starting antibiotics, there's probably no real reason to continue to put a probiotic into that baby's stomach. And I would agree exactly with what Mark said, and that's generally our approach is when an infant is made NPO, they would stop um, receiving probiotics. Well, I just want to thank uh, all the participants and my um, co-presenters and, and really across the whole range of of uh, these three webinars. It's been a, a learning experience for me and I've certainly enjoyed sharing thoughts and hearing the thoughts of others. Yeah, absolutely. I also wanna mention that we are hosting, um, or we're hoping to host a fall webinar series later this year. So, um, but we really want your feedback on what topics you would find most interesting. So if you can please take the time to fill out this very short evaluation, I included the link in the chat box, um, because again, we really wanna make sure that we are tailoring whatever topics that we present in the fall to our community's interests and what the, it, you know, what we all wanna learn about. So please take the time to provide um, your feedback and your evaluation and thank you so much for, for joining.